Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is John Burke, and I will be uh, moderating today's discussions on adhesive solutions for the most challenging applications and substrates. Uh, over the next half hour or so, we'll be discussing the reasons for those difficulties, solutions for them, and surface treatments that you can uh, use to provide increased bond strength when using uh, adhesives. Uh, so before we get started, I do want to introduce the hosts. Uh, Andrew was there speaking earlier. He's the National Sales Manager here at Chemical Concepts. Uh, also joining him will be Jonathan Sen. He is uh, Permavon's Regional Sales Manager. And uh, with him as well as Alex Clark. He's Permavon's Application Development Specialist. Uh, before handing this over to the Permavon team, I, I did want to let everyone know we will be monitoring the Q&A section. Uh, that you'll see in the chat box there and we'll be monitoring the chat box too so you can drop any questions you have in either of those areas and we'll, we'll either answer them during the presentation or post uh, in our Q&A section so uh, without further ado Jonathan please feel free to lead the way thanks John as John said I'm Jonathan Sen the regional sales manager for uh, Permabond Adhesives and today along with Alex Clark my application engineer we're going to be discussing uh, some of the difficult to bond substrates out there. Um, chemical Concepts and Permabond, we both get tons of calls every day about someone trying to bond uh, substrates such, such as PTFE, polyethylene, or polypropylene, which are notoriously hard to bond. So today we're gonna to be just discussing why these substrates are so hard to bond, um, how to overcome these, the challenges these substrates uh, face us, and um, what are what's some of the solutions we have out there for these? We'll also go over some of the case studies we've done, and as well as the, at the end of the presentation, we'll do a QA and a se session. A little bit about Permabon. We've been a world leader in industrial adhesives for over 60 years. We manufacture a wide range of adhesives, such as cyanide acrylates, which most people refer to as super glues, anaerobic adhesives, which are your thread lockers and sealants, epoxies, UV curable adhesives, and structural acrylics. Permabond is a very innovative company. We recently opened a 172,000 square foot state-of-the-art R&D facility that we know what we call our Blue Center. In that facility, we do constant research and development on new, new and existing products out there, as well as we offer technical support to our end users. Uh, they have a we're a unique application. We're able to send their product there and find the best solution for them. At this point, I'll pass it off to Alex Clark, our application engineer. Thank you, John. So um, as uh, Andrew mentioned earlier, I am the application development specialist uh, with Permabond, and I deal with a lot of uh, inquiries from customers. People contact us, and I help uh, discuss their application details and go over which products uh, help find them which adhe help find them which adhesive would be best for their application and you know some some cases we also work on new product development or modifications to existing product to make them more suitable for customers specific uh, requirements so as we were discussing uh, difficult to bond plastics um, why are they difficult to bond and how can you uh, work with those substrates. So the first thing to understand is um, why are they difficult to bond? And that has a lot to do, one of the factors is uh, surface energy. So what is surface energy? Basically surface energy is the, the degree of attraction or repulsion that a material surface exerts on another material. So if you look at a material, it's made up of all of these particles, these, these molecules, atoms that are all connected in some way, they're bonded, there's various uh, intermolecular interactions or forces that are holding a material together. When you cut through a material, you're interrupting all of those interactions, all of those bonds. And there's, there's energy in those bonds, so um, you're interrupting, interrupting those interactions. And the surface energy, you can think of that as, uh, as a way of quantifying um, that energy. Surface, ten a surface tension is uh, a similar concept, so that's related to liquids, and that's the resistance of a fluid to deform or break. Uh, you see this uh, frequently with something like water on a nonstick pan or on wax paper. You see how it beads up, like you see um, on the image on the left there. Um, 
rather than some surfaces it'll wet out nicely like on the image on the right. And that brings us to the idea of wetting. So wetting basically describes the ability of a liquid to spread out over a surface. So that's important when it comes to adhesives, when we're, you know, when we're thinking of, uh, when we're thinking of liquids uh, on a substrate surface, um, we're thinking, so we're thinking of the adhesive on the, whatever substrate you're bonding and um, you want the adhesive to wet out over the surface nicely so that you get good surface coverage of the bond area. Okay, so like I was saying, uh, high surface, a surface, uh, a substrate with high surface energy is going to have more attraction to the adhesive. Um, so it's going to help with bonding. If there's low surface energy, you're going to have less attraction. There's going to be less intermolecular forces going on, um, uh, less interactions between the adhesive and the substrate surface. So that's going to result in poor adhesion. And when it comes to surface tension, you want the adhesive to have low surface tension so that it deforms easily, it wets over the surface more easily, and it covers the bond area uh, more adequately. You want good bond coverage. Obviously, you want to fully cover the entire bond joint so that you have, you maximize your bond strength. The more, the larger the bond area, the more strength you'll have. Um, so it's important to get good coverage over the entire surface. Okay, and how is surface energy measured? So there's a couple ways. Um, basically, surface energy is measured in units of millijoules per square meter. So that's your units of energy per unit area. It can also be expressed in millinewtons per meter or dynes per centimeters. So those, all those units are equivalent. And uh, what you have here, one way to measure surface energy is uh, with dyne pens. So on the left, you have dyne pens. There's a 48 dyne pen. That's the represents the surface energy that you're measuring. And you see the 48 dyne pen on, you mark it on the surface and you see that it beads up. So what that means is that the surface is lower, the surface energy is lower than 48 because um, the ink is not wetting over it. To the right of that, you see the 30 dyne pen wets out nicely over the surface. So that means that the surface energy of that material is 30 or higher. So the dyne pens are, give you a good sense of what kind of surface energy you're uh, working with. Another means of measuring surface energy is with contact angle. So basically you have a liquid that is applied onto a surface and you're measuring the angle where the interface of the liquid and the air meet the substrate surface or the material surface. So you see here there's a surface, there's an angle of about just under 74 degrees. And those angles, that contact angle can be used in a formula to calculate the uh, surface energy. So a lot of times you'll already know what the surface energy is or you'll, you'll know what material you're working with. So you don't really need to worry about um, you know, how to measure it. Um, here are just some examples of various materials. So you have metals on the left there. You see the surface energy uh, is in the hundreds or over a thousand in some cases. So these are quite high numbers. Um, you see copper, stainless steel, and stainless steel, it's a little bit more difficult than steel, but still it has a very high surface energy. And these are quite high compared to your plastics. So you see in the middle, what we consider high surface energy plastics, that includes ABS at 42, acrylic 38, there's polycarbonate down there, 42, PVC 39, uh, rigid PVC 39. And these are all um, considered, you know, there you can't bond these with just any adhesive. A lot of adhesives uh, still can be used for these, um, although there's some that might have a little bit of trouble just because, you know, plastics generally are a little bit harder compared to metals. Um, but ABS is, is generally easier. You'll have many options. Uh, cyanoacrylates, your super glues, will bond to these. Uh, most of these very well. Um, your methyl methacrylates, uh, those are very strong uh, and they will bond to many plastics. So there are options um, with these plastics. You're not getting into the realm where it's going to be too difficult quite yet. Um, there are some exceptions like nylon, even though the surface energy is 46, that can be tricky to deal with. So it's a, it's a general uh, kind of rule, not a, not a, there's always exceptions. And on the left, 
or I mean the right, I'm sorry, on the right there are low surface energy plastics. So now these are getting into the materials that are much more difficult to bond. Uh, you see polyethylene with a surface energy of 31, polypropylene with a surface energy of 29, PTFE, that's your Teflon, at 18. So that's significantly lower than what we have in that middle column. So these are now getting into the area where cyan cyanoacrylates are going to struggle, methyl methacrylates are going to struggle. Pretty much you're going to have trouble with these. You're going to have to do some kind of special surface treatment or some kind of special products in order to use, in order to bond these materials. But you see the, the idea here. The surface energy, as you see the surface energy get much lower, the substrates get much more difficult to bond. Um, there are exceptions, like, like I said earlier, nylon is a little bit tricky to bond, but it, looking at just surface energy, it doesn't look like it should be. Um, so there's exceptions, but this is a general trend, like these low surface energy plastics are, are hard to bond, and that's owing in part due to that low surface energy. Okay, so what are some of these low surface energy plastics? Um, some of the most difficult to bond materials are your polyolefins and fluoropolymers. So some of the common, common polyolefins are polyethylene, that includes HDPE, high density polyethylene, and polypropylene. As far as fluoropolymers go, PTFE is very common, very popular. That's short for polytetrafluoroethylene, or commonly known by the trade name Teflon. And you see on the right here, this sort of just represents, uh, shows you the structure. So you have polyethylene, it's basically a carbon chain with hydrogen atoms. Um, and these are, you know, it's a simple structure. These are, you know, simple, ad simple, a simple molecular structure, but these are very strong bar bonds. They're very stable and it's very difficult for anything to really interrupt these, uh, these, this structure, these bonds. Um, it, it forms a very stable um, structure here. Uh, so it's very difficult for anything to really interact with it. And this is just a repeating uh, structure with that carbon chain. And with PTFE, basically it's a similar structure, but instead of hydrogen, you have fluorine. And that forms uh, a much stronger bond with carbon. So it's even more difficult, uh, more, even more resistant to uh, corrosion or interaction with outside forces. So it's, it's even more difficult to uh, find something that will uh, affect it or bond to it. Okay, so there is a demand for bonding low surface energy plastics. Uh, why would you want to use them? Basically, these are, they offer a lot of good properties. So they can be inexpensive. Uh, they can have uh, high toughness, very resistant to uh, any kind of, um, to very resistant to various forces uh, or stresses that they may experience. They have high temperature resistance and also excellent chemical resistance. So these are all owing due to the strong bonds that they form. Uh, it's very difficult for those to be disturbed. And basically, the same reason that they have those properties is also the same reason that it's very difficult to bond them. Um, it's very difficult for an adhesive to really interact with those surfaces and form a, a good, good bonds with that. So what options do you have for bonding uh, these materials? There are a few choices you have. Uh, number one, you can use uh, special types of surface treatments. And in doing so, that can open up the door to using just about any adhesive you might want. Um, so that gives you a lot of options. Uh, another option is with cyanoacrylates. So these are your super glues. I may, uh, if I refer to CAs, I'm referring to cyanoacrylates. Uh, and basically, you can use a primer. So the cyanoacrylates by themselves aren't going to bond these plastics well. They're going to be very weak. Um, but basically, you can use a primer. And Permabond has a primer, POP, which we'll discuss. So that can be used for these materials. And another option is with no surface treatment, we do have a, a series of, of acrylic products. They're two-part, one-to-one mix ratio acrylics, our TA4600 series, and those are designed for bonding these materials without any surface treatment needed. Okay, so before we get into those options, it's a good idea just to review um, 
sort of surface preparation best practices. So these are just things that you want to do regardless of what surface you're bonding, what substrates you're working with. These are things that you want to do or want to ensure whenever you can. So number one is you want to make sure that your surfaces are clean and dry. Uh, you want to bond to the substrate itself. You don't want any contamination or residue or debris to interfere to get in the way. Uh, so you want to make sure it's clean. You want to make sure it's dry. Moisture will also cause you issues. You know, sometimes some materials can benefit from being baked in the oven for, for a time just to remove, just to totally dry it out and remove moisture. Another option or another uh, step that you want to take if you can is to clean the substrate or at least the bond area with solvent. So a solvent would be typically acetone for metal substrates or isopropanol for uh, plastic. So acetone can be pretty harsh on plastics. It can attack the plastics. Um, and isopropanol will generally be uh, less severe. It'll generally be uh, gentler on plastic. So um, usually you would suggest you'd work with isopropanol for those. But um, always a good idea if you're not sure to just test it on an inconspicuous area just to make sure that the solvent you're using isn't gonna cause any issues on that substrate. And basically, the idea is with the solvent, you're removing contamination, grease, cutting oils, or any mold release agents, any kind of contamination that might be on the surface, debris, dust, or whatever there might be, uh, which will allow the adhesive to bond uh, better to the substrate. And always, you'll want to make sure that you allow the solvent to dry off before applying the adhesive and, and bonding the parts. Another step you'll want to consider is abrasion, uh, lightly abrading the surfaces. And that is especially important on some surfaces like aluminum can benefit from that. Aluminum will develop uh, an, an oxide layer on the surface, which adhesives won't bond as strongly to. So abrasion will allow you to remove that oxide layer. And uh, Therefore, you know, you'll get a, a stronger bond on the, um, you'll be able to bond to the aluminum itself and get a stronger bond. You'll just want to make sure that when you do uh, use abrasion, you'll want to clean the surface with solvent before and after abrasion. Um, you know, afterwards, obviously, to remove the dust from abrading. And with aluminum or with other materials where, where you're concerned about that oxide layer, you'll you want to make sure that you do clean with solvent and bond as soon as possible because as soon as you finish abrading and as soon as you remove that oxide layer it's going to start to develop uh, immediately so the faster you bond the less time you have uh, for that oxide layer to develop so the sooner the better with abrasion if anything if you're going to do one thing out of everything just i would suggest at least cleaning the surface with solvent because what you'll find, I mean, you can in some cases bond the parts as is. Most people would like to bond as is because it's fewer steps, it's quicker, uh, it's easier. Um, but and, and that might work, that might work for you. You might wanna test that out. But what you might find is if you don't clean the surfaces first, you may see that you might not get as much strength as you otherwise would if you clean the surfaces and you might get more inconsistent results. So if you were to test shear strength, for example, uh, the strength might be lower than if you clean and you might have more variability in bond strength. So at least if there's one thing you do, I would at least suggest cleaning the surface with solvent. Okay, now, so now we're dealing with the difficult plastics um, and how you would surface treat those materials. So there's a, a several options available. Um, the simplest being flame treatment, and that's basically as simple as it sounds. You apply a flame to the surface. With plastics, you'll have to be careful because obviously the flame is, ha is hot and certain plastics may melt uh, depending on their melting point. So you'll want to be careful with that. Uh, the corona treatment is another option. Uh, basically with corona treatment, you have a high voltage applied to an electrode. And you see an example of that in the bottom right there. This is from a company that specializes in surface preparation, specifically for adhesive bonding and similar applications. And you see the corona discharge uh, treatment there applied to that surface, to this irregular surface in preparation for bonding. And it might be a similar, a piece with a similar profile that fits over that area. So that, that is very effective in preparing the surface for bonding. And then there's plasma treatment, which is similar to corona, corona treatment. Basically, corona treatment is done in atmospheric air. 
a plasma treatment involves an ionized gas. So you basically have the parts, uh, the air is evacuated, and then the then the gas is, is fills the area. So it's basically um, the ionized gas with the plasma treatment. Another option and something you'll see with PTFE is chemical etching. And that involves uh, basically using a sodium solution to treat the bond surface. And with PTFE, you'll see it'll have a brown surface uh, for the treated surface. And um, basically, that will allow you to bond that very well. Um, another option is primer. Uh, using a primer, there's uh, primers that have a multifunctional reactive group. So one site in the group reacts with the substrate surface, another site reacts with the adhesive. And basically, uh, all these options are effective in increasing the surface energy of the substrate, which will make it much easier to bond. So if you see here on the uh, on the right the chart here shows initial surface energy and then surface energy following plasma treatment. This is for various uh, difficult uh, materials. And you see how the uh, surface energy goes way up to 73 or higher. So now we're getting into the realm where it's much easier to bond and you can pretty much consider any adhesive. Uh, something to con some things to consider is depending on your requirements, you might have to be you might be limited to certain adhesives, so you might have no choice but to use surface treat treatments like these. And another thing too is that most people don't want to do surface treatment like this because it's an extra step. It involves, you have to have the equipment, it takes more time. So most of the time when I ask if people are surface treat treating the, the substrates or if they're willing to, they want to avoid that. So it, just keep in mind it is extra, it is extra work, it is extra cost to do surface treatments like this. So after you surface treat a material, you want to be sure that um, that it was done properly, that you're that you're seeing an increase in surface energy of that substrate. So there's a couple of ways you can check for that if you need to. There's dyne pens that we discussed earlier. Those are probably the most practical. And basically, the idea is you want to you you expect to see better wetting on the surface. Um, these pictures show one of our products. This is actually called our 2K primer, and this primer is not for plastics. It's actually used with our epoxies, uh, typically on metal substrates. In the picture there, it's an aluminum substrate. I just wanted to show it though, just because it's it's got that bright pink color, so it's a very good visual. But basically, you see on the left before surface treatment, you see the the liquid beads up. Uh, in that way, so you can kind of tell that the surface treatment is very good. It could use it could do with some better, um, uh, some better treatments there. And then on the right, you see after surface treatment, you see now how the pink uh, liquid wets out over the surface uh, much nicely, much much nicer. Uh, so that's kind of the difference, and that's what you want to look for when you're uh, treating your uh, surface, whether it's um, difficult to bond plastics or even other substrates. It's a good idea to to check for that if you can. Okay, so the second option is using cyanoacrylates with uh, POP or POP, which is our primer. So what is POP? That's our primer or surface treatment or adhesion promoter, however you want to think of it. And that is used specifically with permabond cyanoacrylates. So these are your super glues, like I mentioned earlier. And these are available in a four ounce bottle that comes with a spray nozzle. So the spray is good for applying to a larger area. And it also comes in a a one gallon bottle, which you see there on the left. And what does POP do? So it, it ensures good adhesion and greatly increases bond strength of CAs on various difficult substrates. So these are, like we discussed earlier, your polyolefins like polyethylene and polypropylene, and also po fluoropolymers like PTFE. And uh, it can also be used on some other uh, difficult substrates like acetyl, it'll be effective, uh, silicone rubber. Uh, is another one that uh, POP will help with. And these substrates really require POP. If you don't use POP and try to bond these materials with cyanoacrylates, you're not going to get any strength really. I mean, you're going to be able to take these, you know, disassemble the parts without, with very little effort. Um, so you really, in these cases, you really need to use the, the primary, if you're, if you're going to use a cyanoacrylate adhesive, and if you don't want to use some kind of surface treatment, the POP is, is required. It's a must, basically. But POP can also improve bond strength on other uh, materials. So stuff like um, 
polystyrene, polyurethane, it may help with. That's something that I've seen sometimes POP helps, sometimes it doesn't really help. Um, so there are some cases, some materials where POP can provide an increase in bond strength, even though you might not really need it. I mean, you might find that you have adequate bond strength without the POP and that's fine. So uh, important thing to remember is that POP doesn't always help. It's not like a cure-all. It's not like, oh, it's a primer where I can use it on everything and it'll get me a stronger bond. It's important to keep in mind that sub-substrates sub don't benefit and sub-substrates will actually, um, you'll actually see worse performance using POP. So a good example is polyamide or nylon. And, and I've seen this as well with our cyanoarchals and POP you'll actually see a decrease in bond strength if you use POP versus if you don't. So that's important to keep in mind. Uh, you don't want to just use POP on everything. In some cases, that actually, um, it could actually hinder your performance. And uh, some materials, they just don't see uh, any increase in bond strength. Like ABS, POP doesn't really uh, provide any increase in bond strength, so you don't really want to use it. Obviously, you don't want to use something that doesn't do anything for you. It's just an extra step. Um, it's a waste of material, so there's no point. How do you apply POP? So basically, the important thing to remember is um, you just want to cover the entire bond surface. So um, basically, you can apply it many ways. Uh, you can spray it. Uh, the four ounce bottle, which you see on the left there, that is that can be that comes with the nozzle so that you can use a spray on the surface if you have a larger bond area that will be easier to cover the area quickly um, you can also wipe the surface use a brush like the one you see in the picture or dip the parts basically the idea is to remember to uh, totally cover the bond area so that you know the entire surface is treated the entire bond surface is treated uh, after you apply the pop you'll want to make sure you allow it to dry so that will take it'll just take on the order of seconds to dry. Uh, and then once you do let it dry, you wanna bond the materials as soon as possible within two hours. So basically after two hours, it loses its effectiveness, but you know you wanna really assemble those parts as soon as possible because it will gradually lose effectiveness over time. Um, and then after two hours, it's, it gets to a point where it's just not very effective. So really as soon as possible is the best way to use it. And uh, as far as using it with other adhesives. So sometimes we get people who are asking about POP and they're asking about using it with another adhesive. And POP is only compatible for use with cyanoacrylate. So it's just based on the chemistry. Um, so you can't use it with any other products, just CAs. And there are various types of CAs. So you, know, you do have CAs that have higher temperature resistance that can resist, resist up to um, 120C or 250. C, for example, so you can get higher temperature resistance if you need it. There are CAs that are toughened um, so that they can better resist vibration and impact. Um, we do also have some relatively new CAs that are more flexible. So I know with toughened CAs, you look at the data sheet and it describes it as, as flexible, but that's really flexible relative to other CAs compared to other other types of adhesives, other chemistries, it's really still quite brittle. And that's kind of the issue with CAs is that they, they do form very brittle bonds uh, when they are fully cured and they can be prone to, uh, to, to breaking or failing. And our, we do have some flexible CAs which are much more flexible than what you would expect with a CA. So these are things that have like 400% elongation um, and you can basically take the material, the cured adhesive and you can stretch it and, and twist it and it, will, and it will stay intact. So those are very interesting. If that's something that you you, you're interested, you can ask us more about those. Um, but basically the idea is there's various types of, of CAs out there. Um, so you do have some uh, variety, but really if you're looking, for, if you have an application where the bond joint is gonna be under um, various types of stresses, if it's gonna be under some difficult exposures, um, outdoor exposures, uh, if it's gonna be exposed to the elements or to moisture, because uh, moisture will attack cyanoacrylates over time and cause the bond to fail. Um, if it's gonna be exposed to uh, structural loads, you're gonna to wanna to go with an adhesive that is more durable. And uh, we do have some products for that. And with that, I'll turn it over to Andrew to discuss those. All right, thanks Alex, I appreciate that. 
So yeah, the, the, the third option that we're gonna be discussing is the uh, Permavon TA4600 series. Um, so we've, we've heard about you know, uh, the, the various treatments, the corona treatments, the plasma treatments that allow you to use uh, various adhesives. We've heard about uh, the POP, and, but that limits you to CAs. And yeah, there's different types of CAs, but oftentimes people wanna use a structural adhesive um, similar to, you know, an epoxy uh, or, a, or an acrylic adhesive, which is this kind of chemistry. Um, but they also don't want to do those extra steps of having a corona uh, treatment, either because it's not compatible with their process, they have certain timing requirements, they're just trying to optimize, you know, throughput from their, from their operation. So there's a lot of reasons why somebody would would, choose, would be looking for a solution where, how do I get that structural adhesive strength, that structural adhesive toughness, durability, performance, but also in a, in a situation where I don't have to add these extra steps. So that's kind of what this product is designed to do. Um, so this is an acrylic adhesive or it's a methyl methacrylate it is the uh, complicated name. Most people know these as acrylics and there's a lot of acrylics out there. It's a very uh, uh, common adhesive technology if you've worked with these kinds of materials in the past, uh, but it has special additives, specially formulated um, to get those better bonds for these difficult to bond materials. Um, you know, such as your polypropylenes, your polyethylenes, your, your PTFEs, uh, et cetera. Um, so one of the reasons you'd want to use these, you know, versus some of the other uh, 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 technologies, uh, chemistries that we've already discussed, uh, you know, the acrylics have uh, much better resistance. So they've got better resistance against water, chemicals, uh, usually very good impact resistance. Um, they're usually very uh, durable in, in different environments, whether it's something interior, exterior, uh, something with it, some kind of a chemical exposure, um, or just even just weather in, uh, weathering uh, in, in the outdoors uh, where it's going to be exposed to some wear and tear. You want something that's going to be have some toughness to it. Uh, so those, that's kind of the reason why you would look at something like this. Uh, you know, a little bit more about uh, just kind of the, the, the features and benefits. Um, with this product, obviously eliminates the need to do those uh, treatments that we talked about. Uh, this is a one-to-one -one ratio product. So if you might've seen uh, adhesives that come in cartridges where you have one big side and one little side and, uh, you know, having a one-to-one -one mix ratio certainly makes things simplified both for automated equipment um, or for hand dispensing. Uh, it, it just eliminates the amount of things that can go wrong. They're more tolerant if, if you do have a, 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 a variance one way or the other with too much hardener or too much resin or, or, some, or the reverse. Uh, you, you know, they're, they're more forgiving, I guess is the word. Um, what's, what's also unique about these compared to other acrylics, if you've ever worked with these things and tried to ship them or, you know, if you can control your inventory, they're not a problem. Uh, if you run into an emergency situation where you need them, maybe you've run into this where they, they're usually hazardous. They're, they're usually what's considered limited quantity. So uh, you have no uh, extra uh, thing to do when you try to ship them by ground. Um, but when you put them on an airplane, then they're suddenly considered hazardous. Uh, and that's where the, the overnight fees uh, can get really, really out of hand if you get into a jam. So uh, these products, unlike any other acrylic that, that I've seen, uh, is, is non-hazardous for transport, which is very interesting. Um, they, they can bond a wide range of surfaces and they can cross bond. Uh, now, if you're not, if one of the two materials you're bonding is not a difficult to bond substrate, I would probably point you in a different direction just in terms of using the right tool for the job. But um, if you're looking to cross bond, say, you know, acrylic to polypropylene or acrylic to polyethylene or metal to, you know, stainless steel to polyethylene. Um, these are the areas where you'd start to look at a product like this, where you'd get really good results on both sides. Um, you know, we get a lot of calls just, you know, people are often amazed when I talk to them that there's even an adhesive that, that can bond to PTFE or Teflon at all. Uh, you know, many people are familiar with kind of the frying pan idea where, uh, you know, not a lot of stuff really wants to stick to it. So it, it is pretty interesting that, that that's available. Uh, the other thing that's about this series is that there are some different products. I'm going to show you a chart in a second um, that gives you some different curing speeds. So you can really dial in the right product. They all end up in the same uh, final performance characteristics. Uh, but if you're looking for a little bit faster, a little bit slower, maybe you have larger parts, you want some more time to put them together, there is the 4620 series uh, or the 4620 product, I should say, that has a handling time of 90 minutes. Uh, and then uh, there is a low odor version if you're working in enclosed spaces or you have some uh, operators that are particularly sensitive to the odors of these things. That's a new product that, uh, that I'll be talking about in a second. 
uh, as well. So th this gives you a little breakdown of the uh, available, uh, of the performance characteristics between the available uh, variants. Uh, so the two main ones are the 4605 and the 4610. And you can think of the last two digits um, almost as a, uh, a proxy, as a stand-in for the, uh, the, the curing time. So uh, the TA4605, if you think the 05 is about five minutes of working time, and the 4610 is about uh, 10 minutes of, of uh, working time, it's, it says 12 right there, but uh, you know, it gives you an idea that how to remember you know, which one is which. So uh, if you look at the most of the, the rest of the performance characteristics between all three products, when you look at strength on polypropylene, strength on polyethylene, uh, strength on rubbers like EPDM, you know, the final characteristics are the same. Uh, you just have different timing sequences in the first two cases. Uh, in the next case, the 4611, uh, the, the really difference here is the, uh, the, the absence of spacer beads. So both the 4605 and the 4610 have a glass bead technology. Uh, and what that does is there's actually little beads uh, of glass that are mixed into the material that are a certain size, typically uh, 10 mil, uh, 10 thousandths of an inch. Uh, and so when you clamp these things together, that acts as a spacer and make sure that you can't over clamp and squeeze all the glue out of the joint. And then, you know, the thing fails and you wonder, well, why did it fail? Well, you know, the thing was clamped so hard that there was no glue left. So uh, what that, those spacer beads allow you to do is, you know, get a very precise bond line, which gives you more consistent results and protects you uh, against human error, which is, uh, you know, for those of us in engineering and those of us in management, you know, very interested in controlling uh, as many variables as we can. Uh, there is the 4611, which doesn't have those glass beads. And the reason you might not want them is if you're, if you're having uh, dispensing equipment, uh, if you buy them in cartridges, probably not an issue. Um, if you're using dispensing equipment, those glass beads are notorious for, uh, you know, getting in, you know, kind of gumming up the works and damaging uh, uh, some of the dispensing equipment that's out there with meter mix machines. Uh, or maybe you just have really tight gaps or really tight tolerances where you want to have a, a, a gap that's less than 10 thousandths, then you might want to look at that 4611. But this just gives you an idea of the three main products. Uh, and then the fourth one, which is uh, just released, I don't even know if it's available yet, but it should be available very shortly if it's not available uh, right now, is this uh, 4631, uh, which was a tweak where some customers had asked us for a low odor version of the product. Uh, the product does have somewhat of a, uh, an odor to it based on that's a little bit different than, you know, all of the methacrylates have some kind of an odor. That's uh, something, a, kind of a hallmark if you've ever worked with these kinds of materials. Uh, so typically they want to be used in, in ventilated spaces. But this particular product has low odor. It does have adhesion to, uh, you know, a wide variety, you know, a lot of the same materials that, uh, that the, uh, the rest of the 4600 series and still retains that ability to bond. Uh, you know, without a primer. So that's something that that's, uh, should be pretty exciting uh, for those people that are, that are dealing with that. Um, so a little bit more about things to know about this product, how it might be different than other adhesives that you might uh, be aware of or you've worked with in the past. Um, the one thing is just kind of an odd appearance. If you've used structural adhesives before, uh, you know, the first time I used it, I was like, wow, this stuff looks pretty unusual. And, and obviously the, the, some of the things that are done to it to make it, to give it that performance on these polyethylene, they do affect the, uh, the physical characteristics. So you can see what the uncured product looks like. You can almost visibly see those little bubbles, which are like the glass beads in there. And then there, the, as the material cures and shrinks slightly, uh, it, it does have this almost like fabric kind of like appearance. So you can see what the cured material looks like uh, when it lays on the surface. Um, so that uh, gives you an idea of what it looks like. If you, I've had customers that have tried this for the first time and they call me and they say, I don't think this is working right. It looks weird. You know, this, this is a picture you can show you. No, no, that's exactly how it's intended to work. That's, that's just something that's the nature of the material. Um, also similar to a lot of other acrylics, but maybe especially so with these products is you have to be concerned with air inhibition. Uh, so if you just try and put a bead of this adhesive on the surface uh, and it's not uh, enclosed on both sides. So typically when we glue things together, you're, you've got glue in the middle in a joint and, and there's very little adhesive that's maybe just on the edges that's exposed to the air. Uh, when you put a bead on the surface, you know, you have a lot of air now that's contacting the material. And uh, what that can do is the outside layer of adhesive will maybe uh, cure a bit slower and may appear softer. 
um, whereas the rest of the adhesive that's inside the joint will be cured solid. So sometimes people will put a bead out on a piece of cardboard as they're testing it and they'll see, oh, well, this material is soft. I don't think it worked. I think that the, you know, the, uh, maybe they start to grow, you know, to suspect that the material that's, that's in the joint isn't gonna cure properly. No, that's not the case. The, the stuff that's in the joint will cure fine. Um, you just may wanna keep that in mind depending on, uh, you know, when you're designing your joints, you want to design them in such a way or, or use this product mostly in areas where both sides of the joint are enclosed. Uh, the other thing is just shelf life. Uh, you know, pros and cons, the stuff does bond uh, tremendous to these materials and very few other products will do that. But on the negative side, uh, it does have a reduced shelf life due to the, the, the additives that give it that performance. So um, what I would just say here is, you know, we'll, we're looking at between a four and nine month shelf life, depending on the product that's selected. Uh, so just, well, I always caution new users to this product is uh, just make sure that you're not buying more than you need. Try and control your inventory. Uh, you know, look at what your forecast is. You know, we can typically get this material out very quickly. Like you said, you don't have to worry about overnight fees being radically expensive due to hazardous uh, fees. So uh, if you get into a jam, we could always get you more product, but uh, you don't want to be end up sitting on too much of this stuff and have it sitting around. Uh, the other thing is storage conditions. So this material is very uh, finicky when it comes to the heat. Uh, so you do want to make sure that you're keeping it at room temperature or below. We, we keep it refrigerated at, at our facility. We've got walk-in refrigeration where we store these things. So if you're say in Florida or in, in the South or in you know, Arizona, Nevada, um, you want to keep these in, in an office area or even better if you can keep them in a cool or a refrigerated area. Um, that will definitely preserve it. Uh, I've definitely had some calls where I've, uh, I've sent a sample to someone and, you know, it would, in a perfect world, those samples will get tested within a week where this is sitting on somebody's uh, hot desk in a, uh, in a warehouse ready to be tested. And then finally, when, when the customer gets around to try it, uh, you know, the product's no longer good anymore. So you do want to be extra careful about, uh, you know, how, how this product is stored. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass that on to uh, Alex, who's going to take us through uh, some of the applications and, uh, and go deeper into a uh, case study here. Alex? Okay. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so one of the most common applications that I get calls for, uh, it has to do with basically um, slide supports or pipe supports. These are basically cases such as you see here where you have, um, you have someone bonding PTFE to steel or stainless steel. And basically that surface um, is where the, the pipe will rest and it basically allow that uh, system, that pipe to be able to move um, without being damaged since the Teflon is a soft uh, or a slippery uh, low friction surface, allow it to move without damaging anything and also um, allow for movement due to um, thermal expansion and contraction from being in an outdoor environment. Um, when you have temperature changes. So um, this is this we get similar applications uh, to this very frequently. Um, in this case, it's for, uh, for marine pipe support bonding, and this is on a boat. So this is an outdoor application. And um, I mean, really the only other option that we would have for bonding PTFE to uh, stainless steel would be to use POP um, with a cyanoacrylate with the POP applied to the PTFE. But uh, for an outdoor exposure, that's not a great choice because uh, like I mentioned earlier, moisture and humidity will gradually uh, attack the uh, cyanoacrylate bond and cause it to degrade over time, which will result in uh, failure eventually. So really for something where you're, where you're talking about outdoor exposures and um, just applications where you might want a little bit more durability, um, the TA4610 and other TA4600 series products do very well in these types of applications. So in this case, TA4610 was a very good fit. And we get a lot of, um, a lot of requests for, for these types of applications. Um, so there are other applications. Uh, just for example, uh, some examples of things I have seen. Um, there's workbenches. So you might have, let's say, or a table where you have a sheet of PTFE or HDPE uh, bonded to, um, to the table, to the top. So that gives a workspace where you can work with uh, assembling a, a product uh, without damaging the product, without um, causing scratches or dents anywhere because of that uh, low friction surface. Um, so uh, that works well for that. Um, exterior cabinets, again, exterior out, outdoor application, outdoor furniture. Uh, we sometimes see helmets where one of the substrates is HDP or another difficult 
uh, material. Um, obviously, with the impact and vibration that might be associated with the helmet, with the uh, with the uh, stresses that it may see, you wouldn't want to use a cyanoracolate because those will be prone to to breakage under those types of conditions. Um, radar assemblies for cars was something I've seen. Um, a solar tracker for panels, so that's something where you have the uh, the tracker adjusts the assembly to face the sun, which is uh, obviously very useful for a solar panel. Um, there's growing benches and mist sensors. These are for um, uh, uh, agriculture related um, applications. Again, outdoor exposures, uh, exposure to humidity. Um, there's artificial trees, EPDM gaskets. So let's say you have a situation where there's maybe some, uh, some moisture or um, you know, some, some steam perhaps, some humidity, where a CA would not be a great fit. Um, that's, a, that's an option for you. Um, signage, um, signs that are gonna be outdoors. There's also pallets uh, where you have, uh, we are all familiar with those wooden pallets that are used to store and move um, products. Um, so there are also plastic pallets that are made of HDPE or polypropylene, sometimes recycled materials, and they're, um, they may use an adhesive to bond parts of those pallets together. Um, so those are some options. And the common thing with a lot of these is you have applications where the bond joint might see a bit more stress. You have applications where they're gonna be outdoors, exposed to moisture, humidity, and thermal cycling, potentially. The TA4600 series do have some flexibility, so that also helps withstand those types of stresses. Um, so, so yeah, there's various applications where um, they can be used. And with that, um, that's, that's uh, largely the informational part of the, uh, of the webinar here. So I'll turn it back over to Andrew to finish, the, finish it off. Yeah, so I'm gonna, t uh, in, in a minute, I'm just gonna show you some resources of uh, where you can learn more. Um, before I get to that, I just wanted to show you just a couple of photos um, from some uh, tests that we've done and some applications that we've done just real quick, just to get an idea. Uh, so here's an, another kind of case study where, uh, the, the customer asked us to bond uh, a acrylic solid surface. So if you're familiar with like Corian, uh, this is a countertop material, which is the green product right there. Um, I don't know who wants a, a green countertop, but we'll put that aside for a second. Uh, and then they wanted to bond this to HDPE. I believe this was a material that's called Starboard, if you're familiar with Starboard. Uh, this is a HDPE marine board product that's used often in uh, marine application signage, outdoor cabinetry. Uh, so this was for an outdoor cabinetry where they had uh, um, a solid surface top on a HDPE ca uh, cabinetry base and they were looking for an adhesive, uh, I believe this was for some sort of a uh, theme park kind of situation uh, where they had some kind of outdoor cabinetry where, where people would, uh, would gather. Uh, so they asked us to do some testing for them to make sure that it would be suitable and work for the application. So we did a various uh, a round of tests here. Um, there's actually a YouTube video of us uh, of going through the testing, including some, <clears throat> excuse me, including some destructive testing. Uh, at what point I'm standing on some of the pieces, I'm hitting them with a with a hammer with progressively larger and larger hammers. So actually, uh, we'll drop that in the the comments if anyone wants to check out that video. Uh, and here's just an example of you know just showing some of the performance. I tried to get a still of hitting it with the hammer. That didn't quite tell the story, but this is just a butt joint. Um, and if, if for as adhesive guys, when we help customers design joints and, and uh, des work with applications, we always advise against uh, butt joints because they do offer such little surface area, which, which translates to much lower strength. So this is kind of like uh, the worst of the worst that you could throw at something like this. Um, we would probably design this joint differently, but we really wanted to show what this adhesive could do. Um, so here we bonded this uh, piece of solid surface uh, and made a T with the HDPE material. So we're cross bonding and then I'm standing on it and then I actually jump up and down on it, uh, you know, not too much, a couple of hops. And, uh, you know, I did eventually, believe me, I kept jumping up and down until, until it broke, but it's still a pretty impressive display uh, of what this product can do. Um, so yeah, that, that kind of brings us to, uh, to the resource to learn more. Um, we, you know, we are not just a, uh, a glue company, not just a store. Uh, we want to be, you know, uh, uh, application support. We want to help you guys help solve your challenges. Uh, so please contact us for, uh, for uh, you know, be happy to discuss your particular application, your process. Uh, we can talk about some of the different options or, or that we discussed today or even something else and try and see what would be the best fit for you. Um, 
we will be sending a follow-up email after all this and after we get through the Q&A section probably tomorrow morning and, and uh, you can feel free to email us ahead of time or there'll be a button for you to try and request a, uh, a, a consultation to discuss uh, any challenges that you're dealing with. Um, we've got my contact information, Alex's and John Sen's uh, up on here. You've got our uh, sales email address, uh, our office number, and our, there's a lot of information on our website. Uh, also, we're going to be sending out a, a PDF uh, of these of this slide deck and all the links will work. Um, so, you know, you could just click right on there, get to our YouTube page, get to our website very easily without uh, having to type in a lot of things. Uh, and then before we get to the Q&A, just, uh, you know, a little uh, kind of learn more idea here. Um, and it, it, it don't know how much you know about permabond or chemical concepts, but we sell a whole assortment of uh, adhesive sealants, tapes, specialty fasteners, um, you know, whether you do casting and molding or electronics or you do potting or any of those kinds of things, we consider ourselves really assembly people. So whatever your challenge is uh, between us and Permabond and the other lines that we have uh, in terms of fasteners and tapes and other things, uh, you know, we could certainly help you with uh, any of these assembly challenges that, that you're running into. Uh, and then, uh, you know, as we're all dealing with this new COVID world uh, and hopefully getting to the tail end of that soon, uh, we've been helping a lot of businesses with other specialty chemicals, including the disinfectants and sanitizers and, uh, you know, tapes and signage for uh, social distancing and all that. So if we can help you and your business with that, we'd be happy to do that as well. So with that, I will pass it off to John so uh, we can kick off the, uh, the Q&A and uh, try and get some of your questions answered. Thank you, Andrew and Alex and, and John. Really, really appreciate that. A uh, lot, to, lot to go over there with everybody, I'm sure. Uh, everyone has some unique applications. It seems when I field calls, uh, um, it's always something pretty unique when it comes to these, these hard to bond plastics, low energy substrates. Um, so I'll, I'll delve right into these Q and A's. Uh, you'll see in the lower section of your, of your, uh, your Zoom there, uh, there is a Q&A section. Feel free to drop any questions there. I'm also uh, taking a look at the, the chat box as well. So I'll keep an eye on that and, and bring up any questions to these guys uh, too. So um, one of the questions during the, the, uh, uh, the presentation was from Pam. Um, she uh, mentioned that they currently use the Permabond with the POP primer for boat enclosures. Um, it's a, it's a clear acrylic boat enclosure glued to a pocket of fabric that is PVC coated. And uh, supposedly Pam is seeing some increased breakage with the clear acrylic. Um, she asked if there's, there's another product or technique that, that you would recommend to, to lessen these breakage issues uh, and possibly something more flexible than the, the CA glue that they're using currently. Yeah, so I'm, I'm curious, um how they help him uh, came about to using uh, POP because I wouldn't expect that POP should be necessary for those substrates. Uh, so I'm curious what came about using that and you know what sort of results they were seeing before using POP. Um, but uh, basically, I mean, if you do need something more flexible, I mean, I'm assuming it sounds like the, the acrylic itself is, is breaking. So you're getting substrate failure. Um, uh, I'm kind of curious what kind of stresses are, are leading to that specifically. Um, I mean, if you're looking for something more flexible, you could look into, I did mention the flexible CAs earlier. Um, it's, it's hard to say. I kind of want to get more details about, you know, what's going on. I, I, I do see that there's a, like you're using a fabric uh, type of material and um, sometimes fabrics can be a little bit of a challenge because uh, if they're porous, especially, they can uh, the C the CA can wick into the material. So, um, if uh, one of the effects of POP that sort of a secondary effect is it does uh, tend to increase the cure uh, increase the cure speed a little bit. Um, so sometimes you can see faster cure time, cure speeds, faster fixture time with that. So it might be a case with the with the fabric. Um, we do have an accelerator for. Uh, cyanoacrylates QFS 16 and that can be used that might help on the uh, on the on the fabric substrate to make sure that the CA doesn't wick into it um, but it's hard to say I'd, I would want to get more details about so, that. So Pam we'll, we'll definitely reach out to you um, you know after this and, and, and talk about this application a little bit more uh, but you know one thing that maybe you could speak on Alex is 
you know, I know like, like with crazing and, and that kind of thing. I mean, there, there can be kind of interactions. I don't know what, we'll have to see what the root cause is of the, the, mm -hmm. the breakage in the acrylic. But can, can you talk a little bit just about uh, CAs and, and polycarbonate and acrylic and, you know, what we could look for in terms of those kinds of materials? Yeah, I mean, some, adhes yeah, some adhesives will, uh, you know, will attack the, um, the certain plastics. And we see that, uh, especially sometimes with, with uh, methyl methacrylates um, or, or with certain uh, pr primers or accelerators you might use. Um, anaerobics adhesives like your thread lockers you don't want to use on plastics because they will they won't fully cure and they will attack the plastic and cause it to cause it to crack or break so that's an issue one way you can get around that is by increasing the cure speed so then again that's another thing where um, QFS 16 can help so if the sino if the adhesive is fully cured and solid it's not going to be able to attack the uh, material anymore so that can help um, but um, increasing the cure speed or um, or, you know, just uh, we could look at other adhesives, potentially acrylic uh, might not be, acrylic isn't, uh, there are other options. The PVC fabric might be an issue, but um, uh, we, I would, like I said, I would want to find out more details about the nature of the failure. Yeah, yeah, I think we'll, uh, we might suggest, I don't know if you're seeing the, uh, we'll talk about this more, but whether it's the breakage is just being out and, and wear and tear, or is it something, mm -hmm. you know, some kind of reaction occurring, like, like we said, is it attacking the material? Um, but I think that, you know, possibly the flexible CAs, that would be a, uh, something to, to perhaps sample, and uh, maybe we could help you guys do some tests uh, to see what we can do to, to get you a better performance. Great, thank you, guys. Um, I have another question here from an anonymous attendee. Uh, can you speak more about chemical etching? And they mentioned a sodium solution. Yeah, that that I can't speak uh, about because I, you know, we don't we don't offer those uh, services. Um, it would be best to try to reach out to a, a company that offers that. I think I believe you can purchase PTFE that's pre-etched, um, so that's an option. I just know that. Um, it, it, it does it does do a very good job. We did have a customer who uh, was looking for an adhesive with specific properties, so they were using chemically etched uh, PTFE, and um, they were looking for a certain amount of peel strength, which our our T four six hundred series uh, couldn't quite offer. So, um, you know, what, what they were what we actually were able to see with the with the peeling, um, we, they were using an epoxy, which would normally not bond well at all to um, to the Teflon, but what they were seeing is is with the chemically etched Teflon, they were actually peeling off that that top layer with the the, the etched layer off of the the virgin uh, P, the white PTFE underneath it. So it was actually it was technically substrate failure. So which was I mean as far from an adhesive standpoint, that's what we would like to see is always substrate failure rather than the adhesive failing. But um, I can't speak more about you know specific as best to. Because uh, we don't really do that stuff, it's best to speak uh, to reach out to a company that, or a manufacturer that offers uh, PTFE that's treated, or or someone who provides that service. Thanks, Alex. Uh, I got a, another question here from El Naz. Um, he asked, "Any permabond product that can bond polypropylene to polypropylene in an environment with a chlorine solution at a pH of two to ten, temperatures varying around forty-five degrees Celsius." Yeah, so the, the big question is, um, I would want to know is if this is going to be something that's um, submerged in that solution, and if so, for how long, or if it's more like an incidental exposure, because um, especially if you're dealing with strong acids or bases, those could attack adhesives, so it really depends on how much uh, exposure it's seeing to that solution, and it will, um, you know, it depends on how long it will be. So you know, we'd want to find out more about that. Um, it's something that's going to require testing because, you know, a lot of a lot of customers, a lot of people will have specific conditions and ultimately the best way to be sure is to uh, test it because we don't always have specifics uh, with, you know, the specific conditions that a customer will be working with. One thing I can tell you is definitely you probably won't want to use a cyanoacrylate because you're talking about a solution, it's aqueous, um, and that is going to going to attack the cyanoacrylate. So I would suggest the best bet for you would be uh, TA4600 series, TA4610, or, you know, TA4605 if you want something uh, a bit faster. But the temperature range shouldn't be an issue. Uh, it's just the chemical exposure is mainly the thing to test. Right. 
you know, here, here's the, and, and uh, Elnaz will definitely uh, reach out to you as well to try and collect some info, maybe get you a bit more detailed answer. So, uh, you know, look out for communication from us in, uh, you know, within a day or so. Um, you know, another thing that kind of popped in my head that when, when uh, actually during the course of this presentation, when we were looking at the different materials, now something I get asked about all the time, which is glass. And, you know, you, you noticed that, uh, you know, glass actually was pretty high surface energy. Um, so really shouldn't be difficult to bond just from a surface energy standpoint, but I do know that people, you know, glass kind of sweats and often you need primers for glass to get. So could you just speak a little bit more about just, that's a really common material that people are trying to bond all the time. So can you just speak a little bit out on just kind of uh, the basics of bonding glass? Yeah, I mean, glass, uh, glass can be tricky. Um, you know, basically, uh, you know, I don't have specifics on, you know, the chemistry that's going on. Um, you know, with, with what makes it, you know, harder to bond. Um, but, you know, we do typically for bonding glass, we would usually uh, suggest um, our UV curables. If UV curing is an option, um, those are designed specifically for glass. We have options for bonding glass to, to metals, for bonding glass to plastics like polycarbonate or acrylic. You just have to make sure that you have a clear substrate so the UV can, light can reach the bond joint. Um, if you're working with bonding glass to like a, a difficult plastic like polypropylene or polyethylene, that's going to be difficult, and um, we don't have there. We don't have any products that we'd recommend for that. It's one of those situations where you may need to look into surface treatment of, of either either substrate or both of them to get a good performance. Yeah, and do, do you guys often do you guys recommend? Uh, I mean, with some of the UVs, you get pretty much primerless adhesion to glass, or do you ever recommend a primer for glass? Yeah, you don't need um, the primers with our UV curables. It's you know we'd only just recommend the same thing. You same surface prep for any material. So you know clean this surface. Um, some some like acrylics and polycarbonate that'll have like a, a backing that you peel off, and usually that'll be fine because that that'll keep the surface clean and free of contamination. Um, but um, basically, we do have, I mean, we do have some other products. We do have a modified epoxy um, that can be used for, for glass. There is a, a, a methyl methacrylate that we have, a surface activated product, TA4246, which actually has an adhesion promoter uh, for glass in the resin. So basically, you would apply the initiator to the other surface and the resin to the, to the glass substrate to, to bond it, and that should help. Um, that's a product we sometimes recommend for, for bonding glass when UV curing isn't an option. Great, thanks. Uh, got another one here for you. I uh, question is, and it, re it refers to the the, the TA forty six hundred series. Um, now, just bonding acrylic to acrylic, what would you typically recommend? Would you rec recommend using that TA forty six hundred series, or is there another product? Yeah, acrylic to acrylic, you can certainly use it. The good thing about the TA4600 series is that they are very versatile. So, I mean, you can use them to bond difficult plastics to themselves. You can use it to bond those plastics to metals or to um, composites. And, you know, they'll work, they'll work on difficult plastics and they're also going to work on other uh, plastics like acrylic. So you can use those. Um, it's a good, it's good kind of a option for various, uh, for various materials. Uh, one thing, I mean, if you're going to be bonding metal to metal, there are better options, you know, epoxies and other acrylics will give you higher strength. Um, so really you probably want to use a TA4600 series uh, when you have a difficult plastic involved. But for acrylic, um, we do have some modified epoxies like MT382, MT3821 that will work. Uh, methyl methacrylates will really work well on acrylics also, um, like TA4246, which I mentioned earlier. And acrylics, if the, if the substrate is clear, um, we do have some UV curable adhesives that will bond very well. So um, UV632, UV645 is basically a higher viscosity, like a gel type of, of UV, and those will work very well. Those are specifically designed for uh, acrylic uh, substrates. Um, so those are probably a couple of the best options, the UV curables. You can even use a, a cyanoacrylate, and um, those will work well if, you, if it's not really a structural application. Thanks, Alex. Uh, another another question I actually receive quite a bit is food grade, where they're using like HDPE, uh, some polyethylene, you know, some sort of, of low energy plastic. Um, now, I know you guys have a, a food grade epoxy, which probably wouldn't bond too well to to those substrates, but is there a solution around that? Yeah, so sometimes you are going to be 
limited by your application requirements. Um, you know, depending on what you need. When I was talking about these surface uh, treatments, you might have to go with the surface treatment if your application requirements limit you to certain adhesives. So we do have a couple food grade epoxies. Um, well, they're basically designed to meet, um, uh, to be FDA compliant and the technical data sheet shows you the specific regulation that they're designed to adhere to. But basically ET5145 and ET5147, they're similar. ET5147 has higher temperature resistance, but these are designed for food grade applications, but they're mainly suitable for metal substrates. So they work well for bonding metals. They don't work well for bonding plastics. When it comes to plastics, it really depends on the bond joint, but usually, you don't see a whole lot of strength. And with low surface energy plastics, they're gonna be you know, you know, just as bad as you know, most other epoxies with bonding. So in those cases, you're pretty much gonna be stuck with um, using some kind of uh, surface treatment. Um, we did have a customer who was bonding polypropylene who needed a, uh, food, grade, uh, a food grade adhesive for that. And they eventually went with plasma treating the surfaces and they got great results doing that. Excellent. Thank you. I got another question here from David. Thank you, David. Uh, in bonding flat HDPE uh, surfaces to each other, when a gap between the two is to be avoided, should he be using a non-glass beaded 4600 series agent? And should he still uh, do some surface preparation to that, to that area? Yeah, so the... If, if possible, I mean, the, the micro beads in the TA4605 and TA4610 are there for a reason. It helps to give the adhesive some thickness to improve its resistance to peel stresses uh, and, and, other, and give it other characteristics. So if possible, it's best to allow that gap to be there um, to, uh, to accommodate that. I believe the microspheres are actually, to be specific, um, 0.1 millimeters, which is just a hair under four mils. Um, in diameter. So, I mean, it's a pretty small, it's a, you know, it's a pretty small gap. I mean, when I calculate usage or volume um, with adhesives, um, I usually, and I don't know what the gap is, I usually use three mils as, a, as an example, like for no, you know, no gap. So it is a pretty small gap. Um, but, you know, if you, if you have an application, let's say it's like a retaining application or like a cylindrical bond joint where you have one, one cylindrical piece inserted into, inserted into another, where you're not really concerned about peel strength so much because, you know, it's, uh, because the joint design will prevent peel stresses. Um, in that case, TA4611 or TA4631 will be perfectly suitable because, um, you know, it'll, it'll, they'll allow the gap to be even smaller and you're not worried about those peel stresses and such. So you could go with those. Um, surface preparation, if you can do it, it'll still help you. Like I said, at least, um, at least clean the surface with solvent. Um, you don't need to do anything like plasma or corona treatment with, with the 4600 series, so you're covered there. Um, but yeah, I mean, really, if you can keep the gap there, that's that would be best for maximum. Right, there's got to be some gap, right? Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, the, even without the glass beads, you probably aren't going to get the gap much smaller than that mm -hmm. anyway. So, uh, but you could certainly try uh, both products, but that, that, that certainly makes sense. Great, great. Um, Got another question here for you guys. Um, and, and, and Andrew, you kind of touched on it, but the, the bond joints themselves, I, we, we brought it up a couple different times. Obviously you don't want some butt joints, but is there, is there a preferred um, you know, design for these joints that, that where these adhesives would work best? Yeah, so um, basically, you know, a butt joint is, Basically, what it comes down to is what types of stresses um, will the adhesive, will the bond joint be under, and that you can design a joint to minimize certain types of stresses. So, what you want, and I mean, you could. There's a lot of information out there with regard to joint design, so you can certainly, um, you know, uh, spend a lot of time, you know, researching this stuff. But basically, you know, you want to. You want to design a joint that will increase shear strength. So you basically have, like, if you have a lap joint where you have one substrate bonded overlapping another substrate maybe by like an inch or half an inch something like that and you're basically pulling the substrates in opposite directions that's that's shear and that's very favorable for adhesives um, 
basically compression is, is, is good. It's basically, you know, compressing the adhesive. Tensile is very good. Um, basically pulling if you have a, if you have a joint, like a one inch by one inch uh, surface area and basically pulling the substrates in opposite directions. Um, that's also very favorable. Things you want to avoid are peel stress, like basically where you have, like if you imagine like a banana peel, basically where the stress is concentrated along the edge of the bond line. Um, and then cleavage stress, where again, you have the, basically if you think of splitting wood, like with a, with a, with a, with a wedge, basically you have these two sub solid substrates that are being split apart. Basically you have that stress concentrated along that, the very edge, the very bond line, the edge of the bond line. So, um, you know, butt joints are really bad because you get a lot of potential for peel and cleavage stresses. And, um, you know, a tongue and groove joint is good because you basically have, or like a, a retaining sort of application where you have one piece that sort of sits into like a, into like a, a joint that, where it's surrounded on all sides. So those types of things are, are good to think about. There are more elaborate joints out there, but more often than not, it's more expensive. Uh, it takes more processing to design, to create these joints. So most people tend to go simpler routes. Right. And I, I would just add to that that just since these materials are so much hard to buy, you know, you want to have good joint design in any adhesive joint, uh, but it's that much more important since it's hard to bond these materials as it is. So you want to try and design your joints such to uh, maximize, you know, the surface area. So a lot of times trying people think about adhesives the way they think about like welding where, you know, let me just put two materials together and put a bead of liquid metal between them. Um, but with adhesives, it's really all about surface area, surface area, surface area. So um, you know, and, and uh, the, the other easy answer is just, you know, contact, uh, you know, one of the chemical concepts technical <laughs> representatives and we'll certainly help walk you through, um, you know, what is, you know, appropriate joint design for, for your application. So, so John, I'm just looking at uh, uh, time here. We, the, the presentation itself went a little bit over and now, now into this Q&A, we're about uh, 3.15. So you think we want to give it maybe, give an opportunity for maybe one more question and then we'll, We'll try and take this thing home. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, if anyone wants to, to drop another question, please feel free to right now. We'll, we'll, we'll keep this open for another minute or two. Um, I mean, just on the on, off my mind, um, I was working with someone who was, who was doing cases and we're having issues with blooming and the CAs. Um, now, I know you have a whole line of different CAs and super glues. Is there, is there a line specifically you would recommend maybe that that you said you had the flexible CAs uh, and there is a low bloom CA as well correct right so CA the blooming effect that sort of occurs when the the monomers vaporize and then they interact with moisture in the air because moisture activates CAs and that basically they polymerize in the air and they settle as a dust around the bond joint so there are CAs that are low blooming uh, 947, I believe, is the higher viscosity version. Basically, there's different versions. Yeah, 940 through 947, and they basically vary in viscosity. And these are designed, um, the molecules, the, the monomers are larger, so they are less volatile. So they are not going to be as prone to um, getting into the air and then kind of polymerizing and settling out as this powder. So those are options if you want to stick with the CA. Otherwise, um, you can, depending on the substrates, you can certainly look to other adhesives. But if you want that instant fixture, um, the CA will be a good option. You might also look into add a UV curable if you have clear substrates, um, and that will give you a, a fast uh, cure as well. Great. Thanks so much, Alex. Well, uh, we don't have, it doesn't seem like we have any more questions here, but uh, if something does happen to pop up for anybody attending, uh, here's our contact information once again. We, we have our email address there, sales at chemical-concepts.com. Our office number, 1-800-220-1966. Uh, I do wanna thank Alex, thank you so much. John, thank you so much. And, and Andrew, obviously, uh, for everything in here. Um, Anybody that attended here or signed up will be getting an, an email with, uh, with a copy of this webinar. So you can go through it anytime. It'll be right on YouTube for you. We'll have links in that email as well with different PDFs and flyers and all these products, the flexible CAs, the, the 4600 series, the POP primer, uh, a whole bunch of information will be listed in that email address. Um, but, but I guess that uh, about wraps everything up. If, uh, uh, if anybody wants to reach out, please feel free to at any time. Uh, thank you again, and uh, everyone stay safe.
Looks like you made it there, Andrew. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good way to end it, right? So, all right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> uh, have a great afternoon and hope to talk to everyone soon. Thank you for attending. Thanks, thanks to the so much. guys as well.